I thought I would not read from the Atlantis Manifesto because uh, it's okay. too valuable an opportunity to uh, to read uh, fairly new work, not all new work, because I thought I would just read this uh, in an, in response to Andy's poem about money. I would read my own uh, poem about money from uh, Blackface Manifesto. It's called Financial Disclosures, or the Budget of Poesy, or Eros as starving beggar, or the, uh, the duende of the rhetoricians, break the bank of my heart, uh, <clears throat> worthless as a paper fan on a sultry day in hell. That's the title. Part one. Two ways to be vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis the universe. Pay for a classified ad, please put a spell on me, P.O. Box so-and-so, or be a bank that fails. Ah, the giddy thrill. Desperate punters run amok on bourse. And we lift off, borne aloft, on waves of panic like a box kite on a hawk's breath, pilot of nothing. Two, oh, Carlo Ponzi, secret pharaoh, builder of the first pyramid scheme. I am the John Law of hopeless tulipomania irrational euphoria, secular Pentecostalism, and sickly Platonizing, emotional check-kiting, kite-fighting, you get caught, entangled, cut loose, fall, captured or lost, but for an afternoon, you pierced the cerulean, as your overturned turquoise bowl, <clears throat> you broken-hearted dragonfly, <clears throat> a vast, investment in blue, and nothing to show for it but these clouds. Three, poetry is weather that stays weather, a river that ices over for years at a time. As good a right as the queen, of course, but no collateral, bankrupt as valentine, pink as cheek on brisk day. It's tender, but is it legal? On your threshold, the dust of your threshold increases like interest on debt, exponentially faster than inflation itself, till stars and meteors start to whiz past our heads and we're falling in free fall toward the flesh tone heart of the pluriverse. Four, the besotted and cunning lover lends at 10 or 20 times the amount of actual deposits. Our deepest vaults hold nothing but dead moths that never knew the ecstasy of burning to cinders in the lamp of the beloved's glance. I'd love to ruin myself financially for you, like the great lovers in Balzac we all secretly admire. How often the ardent make mental reservations about bonds and real estate. Only my noon. The fou d'amour can spend money like spunk. On some level, we know we're being conned, but we go along with it because the intermediate payoff quells all hesitation. Lovers live in the leap itself, issued in Weimarian zillions. Our Taoist hell banknotes exist as money only in the smoke of their disappearance in the furnace of the imagination. Credit and credulity, a match made in the very heaven where money goes when it dies. A certain kind of genie that responds only to a certain kind of Aladdin. The sutra of suing for your affections in the chancery of verse, your eternal debtor. Jubilee never comes. Debt mutates into peonage. Crushing abstractions are handed down like family heirlooms. Formerly one could seek sanctuary at certain cathedrals and shrines, but then temples all became banks of universal credit symbolizing debt as cosmic principle. In this case, the beloved must turn bank robber. Metaphor will force you to confess your crime. Security is non-existent. I can feel you zeroing in like a lovely vulture over the town dump. But to be robbed now would be the salvation of this psychic SNL, which otherwise faces chapter 11. Casuistic allegorizing's better than nothing, and nothing's what you'll get from other dealers, pal. Go into hock to your own quivering monadic sensorium. 
pay off deep debts of honor, lost Pascalian wagers, short of sheer abscondage. Buying back paper with new paper always ends in crash, but our secret lies in the certainty that irrational exuberance is an end in itself. Five, the pudding of truth, pink as a shell grotto scented with peony talcum, this fiat currency will buy a sleigh, lacquered blue, drawn by a white pony, a baby squirrel, a weekend in Zamboanga. Come, ruin my dull, rentier liquidity, and we'll roar off together into the lengthy annals of the bad land. is going to be called Ecologues, that's E-C-O parentheses, or sorry, E-C parentheses O logs. So they're ecological eclogues. And they're going to be published by Station Hill Press, which is heavily represented here tonight. Welcome, welcome. <coughs> and this one is called Hibernation. It's actually mostly in prose. No, it's not all, it's not all in prose, but it's, it's somewhat in prose. Right? Yes, it's prose. Runic and hirsute, we pontificate around our Franklin stove like a Victorian rocket ship, earth earthbound and vestal, another crackpot perpetual motion machine, a giant iron swan boat. Pines droop like ladies in tail of Genji, bent low by embrace of snow. And milk, the all pastoral diet, milky messes as Geraldus Cambrensis described dark age Irish cuisine. White food, boiled roots, white pudding, bacon, tea. Okay, white food, boiled roots, white pudding, bacon, tea, cornmeal mush and cream, tinned peaches, ice wine for ice giants, frost patterns on window panes, a lost art, an art of being lost in patterns, in glittering snow light, and skull blue sky light <clears throat> all afternoon as shadows grow like trolls. Seed catalogs, esoteric hermeneutics reveals the plant's agenda, manipulating human consciousness to make the world safe for plants. On the old upright, slightly out of tune, one of us plays Satie's ritual music for Rosicrucian mass in the sentimental style of 1911. Sleep becomes a form of political action. Ice boats like kites on skis or sleighs with Gogolian troikas of ice-crusted percherons. Idol, idol, ideology. Cold is the principle of health and energy. We give ourselves up to narratology, triple X hard cider, and slump back into winter like an old couch. Apparent infinitude of hexagonal variations in snowflakes demonstrates that there is no repetition in theophany. Recent discovery, snow is, quote, caused, unquote, by bizarre bacteria that ride up and down in water between earth and sky like surfers. Each flake has a living pilot, Banzai. Artificial ice was discovered by American alchemist Eugenius Philalethes, otherwise known as George Starkey, while investigating sal ammoniac from the, from the oasis of Amon Ra in Egypt. Frost crystals formed on his glass pelican, but alas, the secret was later stolen by Robert Boyle of Cork, sorcerer's apprentice, who later tried to sell it to the Royal Society but, in karmic payback for betraying his guru, Boyle caught pneumonia while trying to fast freeze a chicken and died 1691, and the secret stayed lost until the 1940s. Pure ice harvested from Adirondack and Catskill Lakes shipped to New Orleans, Cuba, even Calcutta in fast Boston schooners, lost half its 
uh, lost half to melted, but the rest sold for its weight in silver. In high school, we heard rumors of cold freaks who only like sex in snow with icicles, hyper nudists, polar bear love, ice palaces, temporary translucent cathedrals were built in Montreal, Chicago, Moscow, 1890s diamonds big as any Ritz, lit with colored torches and skyrockets, watched by top-hatted and minked Edwardians from their sleighs heaped with bear pelts, ice lingams, ice worm cocktails, snow cones with phosphate syrups in the old days before air conditioning in Alabama. <clears throat> you know what an eclogue is? It's, it's like Virgil's eclogues, poems about country life, basically. So this is my New Jersey eclogue. Early 1950s car plus TV suburbia crept up like some post-Ice Age meltdown, encroaching on the shrinking continent of New Jersey farmland like the hemlock numbness in Socrates' legs. Named for the very landmarks that obliterated, housing developments like the edge of night inched toward terminal chicken farms through fields of dead corn and ghastly cows. Everyone was from somewhere else. Children alone preserved a sense of place based on secret ludic economies, song lines, ley lines, epiphanic meadows, forbidden woods, moving at organic speeds through landscape already haunted by their future memories, already suffused with pastoralist nostalgia for a mundus imaginalis coexistent with the real, such as summer, long as a Vedic yuga, or an abandoned farm in June, endless twilight, boredom as freedom, enchanted boredom, of baked weeds, grass, stains, and algic mud. Already inundated with proto-desire, they admire each other's cuts and bruises. Already neo-pastoralists, they're storing up animist proclivities and crypto-pagan reveries. Out of remnants of a vegetal past, waving bare-legged in a swamp with leeches, smoking corn silk behind the ruined shed, red gold as Jesus' hair in the Lindisfarne Gospels. Lentus in Umbra, reclining in the shade, reclining on dizzily dappled afternoon mown lawn under now extinct chestnut or elm, doing astral projection into the brains of long dead pirates or Scottish Jacobites. Downwind from the decaying chicken farm, manure and sweet Indian grass and burning leaves, suburban, bucolic, New Jersey, Virgil's embryonic psychonauts of 1953. Everyone was always going away. America became a land of souls who have lost their childhood best friends or first loves to grown-up conspiracies of displacement. <clears throat> so that pastoralism has become a revolt of childhood, topophilia and holy ditchweed against progress for an agrarian utopia that was already receding into a past beyond any golden infancy. Feral pastoralism, deliberate reversion back to some ideal date like 1911 or 1795 when even light was thicker and more aromatic, like a green chaos out of Theocritus. Okay, this one's for, this one's for Shiv and uh, Andy and Janine and all the old India hands who are present here today. This is my Benares eclogue. Urban pastoralism is no oxymoron in Benares. 
In 1970, Brother James and I lived on a houseboat moored at a minor upstream gat. Every dawn, a fat Brahmin with a bullhorn coached a dozen would-be Arjunas with huge twirling Indian clubs and oiled torsos, waking us to another otios holy day of lying on our undulant roof, counting 12 different species of birds of prey as half-burnt corpses floated past us toward heaven or Calcutta. Up the stone stairs, past tiny cell crammed with abandoned widows in white saris, chanting ram, 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 to the South Indian one-table vegetarian restaurant for breakfast. Rice cakes with sugar and ghee, or lunch, rice cakes with curried veg, a few chillums with the babas at eventide, worm even one rupee paperbacks by candlelight. Another dawn, laundresses at work, quote, breaking stones with your clothes. Ancient black dows with red lateen sails arrive from the opposite desolate shore with cargoes of sand. We used to eat at the cafe patronized by these sand diggers, very low caste. Chapatis and dal for 50 pice. Ganja, bang, and opium were legal and vended from green government shops with barred windows. Bang ice cream from green good humor men. Local Kali temple drums and bells, devil worship. Narrow alleyways lit by night with oil lamps of tiny hole in wall shops. No electricity. Shiva himself commands the faithful to take bang in Banaras. Moslems in charge of the silk trade. We hang around drinking milky marsala chai, getting eye drunk on opalescent gold wedding saris with descendants of Kabir in their dim emporiums perfumed with extreme attar of roses. Another day at the Ghat, every afternoon a dozen tank-sized water buffalo charge mindlessly down mud slope into sacred river goaded by shiny brown boys to submerge in bliss each day like black rubber submarines of Yama, Lord of Death. Holy Upanishadic white Brahma bulls garlanded with marigolds, horns red with henna, block intersections and steel vegetables. Satanic goats loom up out of the dark. Vedic pastoral economy permeates, percolates, the city, fresh curds, clotted cream, bedtime milk with thick skin, snow white sweets drowned in ghee and cardamom, iced milk with flower syrups, yogurt swirled with ice, bang and rose water. India equals Arcadia. Cows speak to our spiritual DNA. Mu is Om, backwards. Hinduism has preserved our very own lost occidental polytheism. Kali equals Astarte. Boy Krishna equals Orpheus. Shiva equals Dionysus. Zeus equals Brahma. Vishnu equals Apollo. Saraswati equals the Muses, etc. All one vast pastoral culture from Tokaria to Celtic Atlantis. The cow, our mother. Indra rescues the cows, the waters flow, the gods drink soma and get all hallucinogenic. Rig Veda describes it as gold green or ruddy, strained through a golden fleece and mixed with milk, exactly like the bang lassi at the dairy bar in Chandichok. Mornings we take rickshaw to leafy suburb where old theosophical society occupies crumbling Anglo-Indian villa with a veranda and vulture slow ceiling fans. Browse on wormhole 1920s red Ganeshan company treatises on Tantra and pantheistic monism and the Sufism of Ibn Arabi. Free tea from kindly old librarian ladies. Permission to nap on the lawn in the shade of tropical trees and English flowers. Another night of goggle-eyed astronomy in our cradle rocking Victorian mogul houseboat on the river that flows from the top of Shiva's head like a gusher of moonbeams as he smokes chillums prepared for him by Magna Mater Kibele, seated on their tiger skin, 
in the monsoonish Himalayas, melt off of ice lingams, blue as sperm, Ganga equals Ganja, with flesh-eating, sleek, freshwater dolphins sporting in its Kundalini skull-dark waters, snouts bristling with tiny teeth. Actually, it's all one long. It's, it's all one long piece, uh, or selections from one long piece, called rhodomancy. Now, rhodomancy is a word that you will not find in your dictionary. I know because I look, but it does exist, and it means it used to mean uh, back in the 1920s, in the 1820s and 30s, there were a lot of people, especially around here, who were professional occult treasure seekers. Um, as I mentioned in, somewhere in the text, jo Joseph Smith, the, the founder of the Mormons, was a rhodomancer, a professional rhodomancer. And when he dug up the gold tablets of, of the angel Moroni, he was doing it according to these methods, which were very popular and widespread. Washington Irving mentions them. Anyway, I've written, I've written a piece around that concept, and I'm going to read three sections from it. Uh, the second section is called Fugue. This is still handwritten, very new, so pardon, pardon the, the, any infelicities, please. Fugue. Any city of dreams require, any city of dreams requires rickshaws, palmetto fans and candlelight to see you to bed, to watch you sleeping. With the dimethyltryptamine clarity of a snail on moss, or frog amongst water lilies, like some Batrachian Padma Sambhava. 1907 Slumberland Love, a phrase you received on ether or nitrous oxide that explained the whole universe, but later just baffles you, makes no sense at all. Alien and impossible angles, vistas of sentient jewels and semi-conscious pearls. Henry Ford, like the evil Emperor Ming, with Le Comte de Saint-Germain's longevity pills, and his sinister hunchback sidekick Edison, the anti-alchemist, have reigned for 6,000 years, leaving no escape hatch but eldritch, non-Euclidean archways that open on forgotten tunnels and souterrains, underpants of a medieval subconsciousness, coterminous with Sunday morning's ever, ever land, bounded by bedsheets and veridical dreams, the 40th part of prophecy, a pound of hash, three cords of firewood, a shotgun, and a mule. A few thousand old order Anabaptists and some remote tribe in Africa or Amazonia who kill and shrink all strangers on sight, shoot poison darts at UNESCO helicopters, blowing hallucinogenic snuff up each other's nostrils, talking with jaguars or animated vegetables, and you, when you're sleeping, asleep, to steal caresses and kisses from you unawares in REM, tangled in quilts by candlelight, to sample bare feet or taste of hair, surely the most lepidopterous of all perversions laudanum of a prolonged childhood, a tune that's been running through my head for 40 years. You are the omphalos, emanating aromal rays of passional attraction, civet cat of the astral plane, distant skunk on a wet night in August, angel of the water garden outside time, solid as any animate coagulation of empty space, from the seven pre-Adamite kings to a bedroom in suburban New Jersey on a muggy, heavy evening of cicadas and unshed tears. Up until now, art has revealed secrets, but henceforth, its goal will be to hide them. Are we lesser mortals than Dr. Moriarty or Fu Manchu? We too can be geniuses of crime in the privacy of our own epiphany, where midnight thunderstorms brew up a Proustian soup of sweet clover and manure somewhere near West Bovina in Delaware County, New York. No photographs, 
or other authentic records remain, only the faulty memories of witnesses well known as liars, and a perverse scent that ling a pervasive scent that lingers like spent gunpowder or the past indiscretions of a tomcat. Samizdat, published by Lunar Telegraph, telepath dream to dream transmissions outside all electromagnetic spectra, seductive pineal glands of Paleolithic heraldry, Albert Pinkham Ryder writing poems in Hoboken by moonlight and tossing them into the Hudson leaf by leaf one summer night in 1907. Yes, I want to create a work of art like the apparition at Fatima, witnessed by thousands but leaving no palpable trace. Fairy gold that turns to ashes and dead leaves overnight, lost forever on waking in the dentist's chair, as if air or water were suddenly to take on faces and voices, thunder fading into the palimpsest of rain, an apprehensible presence it might even be you, asleep and dreaming here in an hour that lies sideways to night itself. Quote, have we landed on the moon or has the moon descended to this tavern of ruin? Every night with you is the night of power and every night without you the trace of your perfume. No treasure is truly hidden without a coded map handed down from charlatan to dupe since the time of Seth. You be the mountebank, and I your eager sucker, and not even God himself could give it more breath. That's a pseudo-translation from Nudo Shirazi, whom I imagine to have been a 19th century Delhi poet who wrote Persian ghazals in Hindustani style. And then the piece ends with a recipe for peach absinthe moonshine. Fill a large crock pot with quarters of skinned ripe peaches, white sugar, and yeast. Add a bunch of marijuana, a handful of wormwood leaves, and the black powder from seven little firecrackers. Seal hermetically and bury for seven lunar weeks. Dig up, break open, strain, and serve. Okay, and then now part four is called uh, Aladdin's Claustrophobia in the Count of Monte Cristo's grotto, blind white cobras suffocating under pyramids and premature burials. A child's pure greed for primitive accumulation, fecal coins and candy diamonds, mogul carbuncles and Peruvian doubloons, silver ducats rotted in clumps like barnacles, solid emerald goblets and those same old dancing skeletons from the first dynasty again, slain to provide ghosts, to guard the horde with nordo-dragontic heavy breathing and discordant leitmotifs, e.g. anal sex, banned in Canada, and the Indo-European homo shamans mushroom poisoning and ecstatic flight towards Dorian Zeus, the fundamentalist double-headed eagle and golden shower. All treasures are goose eggs found on any dunghill in the alembic of an overheated nursery, pure Saturnian unearned currency stripped of its guilt or guilt in the hands of an infantine proletariat untainted by money, guaranteed to propitiate the gnomes, our mining engineers, our gold bug scarabs, the sun, our dung. Quote, you must dig in utter silence, even when your shovel clunks against the chest or turns over a skull. Otherwise, the treasure will sink slowly, lower and lower, into the earth like a turd in a bowl, till it eludes you and vanishes down the devil's asshole. Quoted from The Secrets of Rhodomancy, or The Seeking and Finding of Hidden Treasures, etc., by the very Reverend Onanias Green, Poughkeepsie, New York, at the Starry Wisdom Steam Press, 1823. Numismatics from Newman, the numinous glowing astral aura radiated by precious metals stamped with efficacious emblems and hieroglyphs, or in pecuniary terms, pecus being Latin for cattle, cows are money, cows shit. Ergo, blue mushrooms grow on cow plops, 
causing a Kirlian halo to emanate into the ultraviolet and vibrate around the entire Aryan barbarian chain of correspondences and signatures like delirious link sausages of blood and mud, black pudding, haggis, boudin, and pink champagne, symbolizing the urana of a red-headed virgin, rich in phosphorescent dream secretions, Dr. Wasson's elixir vitae siberiensis, aureate dew of the pseudo-Dionysian hierarchy, Dr. Otto Gross, drug-addled genius dissident Freudo-Jungian inventor of anarcho-psychiatry, practiced in Berlin, Vienna, coffee houses, nightclubs, seduced all his female patients, would have grasped immediately the Paracelsian or Hegelian trialectic at work here, sexo negredo sublimatio and rosy rose hole of hermaphroditus, slimy earth and solar water, buried treasure, submerged treasure, rose pearl. Last, uh, last poem, last short poem. It's called, uh, it's the part seven of this piece, maybe, if I finish writing this piece. It's called John Humphrey Noyes Goes Into Exile. John Humphrey Noyes was a 19th century utopian socialist and religious visionary who believed in perfectionism, that we could be per perfect here on earth, uh, here and now. And he founded a commune called Oneida. The buildings are still there. Uh, where many, many people, hundreds of people happily for years, practiced um, group sex, basically. And uh, at a certain point, the whole thing fell apart, and uh, John Humphrey Noyes fled to Canada, where he, where he later died. So I'm sort of imagining the moment when he's leaving upstate New York by train and headed for Niagara Falls to, to go over into exile to Canada. Um, John Humphrey Noyes goes into exile. Train stuck for hours in blizzard. Snack car runs out of hot dogs. Drifting toward Niagara. Dreams he's in a barrel. Flight into Canada. It's Hiawathan mists. The deep, unspoken secret of Oneida, he whispered, was oral sex. Not male continence or plural marriage. But noise chickened out, or so claims the Xerox Codex, or lost Masonic word. The passenger's eye, like burglar lantern glim, or ignis fatuus, probes into these old frame houses that turn their rears to the tracks, peers into back bedroom windows, leering with phantom whistles of nostalgia for some poorer reality. Lit by pallid fluorescent theosophical halos, he never jumps train in any nameless podunk or checks into local death of a salesman hotel to live outside the law of averages in some Chautauquan philanstery, landscape and self alike still untransformed. Thoth to Asclepius, over and out, a drowsy recuperation, eating canned peaches and rereading pseudo Eratosthenes. He travels with his favorite diseases, his temporary shrouds, and, provided one is taking the proper medication, of course, soft as a window, a nocturnal Nile, like a midden heap designed by Cagliostro. Can we call it science if it never really works? Recovery from disease is an ideology, all aboard. Leaves palpitating, anticipating thunders, oceanic fluctuations of reflected light. His disease dreams its own proper medicine, making its own RX prescription out of every text. <laughs>